Afternoon, everyone. I'm going to make a start, if that's okay. So, hello, my name is Saji Khan. I'm one of the cardiology consultants at Chelsea and Westminster, and I can see, or I've already heard, people from my patch who are around at this talk today. So, welcome, and welcome to everyone else. So, the talk I've got titled is slightly different from one in the agenda, because I have to confess, I'm not an anaesthetist, and the last thing I wanted was to have anaesthetists in the audience who were going to question my credentials. And I hope, as I talk... I'll convince you all that this is about more than one single specialty or more than one single group of people to solve this patient safety problem. So I start with my conflicts of interest. So I've already confessed I'm a cardiologist and not an anaesthetist. And I've also done a lot of remote monitoring studies in both the chronic disease sort of end of the spectrum as well as the more acute care of the spectrum via my trust and college roles including particularly relevant to this one is I've done some work with the G portrait mobile system and in fact I think we did the worldwide patient validation of that system as the first one and it's something we continue to work on. The other thing that I do is do some work with the Health Foundation. I've just joined their advisory board on engagement which is obviously linked to the University of Cambridge and that's relevant because I will speak a little bit about patients and staff impacts of the, this patient safety problem, although there's a talk later on on the agenda, so most of what I'm going to talk about is technology. And I will also tell you that I'm not a technology geek. I've sort of fallen into it by accident. So I always think about the why. Why do we do something when I start to think both about a talk and also about explaining a story or a clinical problem? And unusually for me, I, I'd made these slides before midnight yesterday. If I'd stuck to my usual pattern... I would have included the slides yesterday from Martha's Law, which I'm sure many of you have seen well in the press. Now, that's a particularly distressing story, and it very, feels very personal to me because I've got a 13-year-old at home whose first day at secondary school was today, like many other people, but that sort of is very personal. And the why for me is about the patient safety and the impacts on patients, carers, and families as to why we do this. You might ask why, as a cardiologist, I got involved in this, and part of that is unfortunately accident. So back in the day when I was starting out as a new consultant, and everyone thinks you've got a wonderful amount of time that you never have anything to do with, I got given the task of looking at the hospital at night system in our local organisation, and I didn't know any better, so took it on, not realising that therein lies a decade plus more of work. And that time interval will come back later as I talk about the challenge. My story is very much flavoured by my own personal experiences and the experience of the trust locally, but I think the data, only the ones that I've given you a glimpse of throughout this talk, but also what you see nationally and globally, in fact, tells you that this is a problem that's everywhere. So I'm only going to talk for about half an hour or so, if I stick to my timings, and that should leave us 10 minutes or so for questions and a discussion before lunch, because obviously that's the most important part of the day. So I talked a little bit about Martha's story and Martha's law, which is being proposed, and I, I think none of us would deny how awful that experience of that family is and that we absolutely have to do better. But you might ask, well, that's just an individual case, isn't it? That we'll always have those. Healthcare, however we look at it, is an extremely risky business, and it grows increasingly risky because of the changes that we see both in the delivery of care and also in terms of the complexity of the treatments that we deliver. So increasingly, that risk will be there. But what about the scope of the harms that come from healthcare? And this study is published earlier this year in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it comes from uh, the hospital system that's in Massachusetts, where they've chosen 10 or 11 hospitals of various sizes, the smallest being under 100 beds, which I don't think we'd really see in the NHS, with the largest being over 700, and looked at care records through the electronic health record, reviewed them to say, OK, how much harm can we identify and the overall results are actually pretty shocking and disappointing. So we're looking at around 3,000 episodes of care, and the average age of the people who are being monitored in this study are 60 years old. So we're not talking about some of our more frail, more elderly, more vulnerable patients that we look after. We're talking generally about people who are probably overall not too unhealthy. So we've got about 3,000 episodes of care, and what we see when those electronic records are reviewed, 
There are about 20, uh, one in four to one in three of them, so just over a thousand, had an adverse harm event flagged as being part of that care process. And of those, there were a significant number, about a quarter again, that were uh, identified as being serious. So we're seeing a significant number of adverse events related to care process, not the underlying disease condition or the reason that the person came into hospital, because those are specifically excluded from this study. But we're seeing a significant number of episodes of harm coming from the care process itself. And if we look at what they're sort of made up of, this gives you the breakdown of the types of harm. And relevant to the last talk where we were talking about pressure ulcers, wound and wound-based care feature particularly strongly in those patients who are in for a surgical or procedurally-based reason. And that's particularly important because in these patients, we see a significant increase in their length of stay, as well as the experience and the discomfort that the patient suffered. About a third of these adverse events that we're identifying are of significant clinical severity. And of these, about one in five of them were, re were recognized as being preventable in the assessment of this independent panel of clinicians who were looking at this data. So that makes pretty depressing reading. But it's not new. So let's go back 30 years to 1991 to the Harvard Medical Practice Study. Now, this study is slightly different because here the focus was on negligence claims rather than harm related to care. And absolutely, as I've already said, in the last 30 years, healthcare has changed almost beyond recognition in terms of the complexity, the nature, and the way that we provide that care. So I hate to tell you this, but 30 years is about my practice lifetime. So I remember sort of what we were like back then. I can really remember the sorts of patients we looked after and the fact that one of my jobs every day was to prescribe the IV heparin for the patients who were in with DVTs, and they would be in for weeks sometimes while we sorted out their anticoagulation. That just doesn't happen anymore. So the background level of risk that we are managing in our general bed base is much greater than it has been any time previously. And linking into that, the data that I've just shown you comes from 2018, so before the COVID pandemic. And coming back to that years in practice, I think all of us would agree that the last few years have been particularly challenging, not just for hospital-based healthcare professionals, but healthcare professionals anywhere providing any kind of support for patients. So in that study, and I've already said it's not directly comparable, the rates of what they identified as negligence, where something could have occurred where harm happened to a patient, was about one in seven of these episodes. So again, horrible and astounding numbers. It's not just in the United States of America or an, NH or an NHS problem. In fact, the World Health, Health Organization has just or not so just, has launched its Global Patient Safety Action Plan. And what it identifies is things that I've already started to allude to, was that this is a complex problem. It's never going to be solved by a single person or a single group of specialists or a single team, because if that had been the case, we would have fixed it by now, and we wouldn't have it. So we've identified that there are a number of different domains that need to come together in order to make this happen. And Included within that is the voice of patients and also the voice of staff, as well as technology, process, and other things that you would all identify. Data forms a part of this, linking into the talk that we've just heard. But I don't think that any of us would disagree with the vision and the goal that the World Health Organization have set out, which is essentially to drive forward policies and strategies based on science, evidence, and stories, and partnerships to eliminate all sources of avoidable risk and harm to patients and health workers. Now, I've already said, I, I know that that's not possible to achieve because healthcare is fundamentally a risky business, but part of what we do is make small incremental changes, sometimes big disruptive changes, but often small incremental changes to get us to that goal and to make healthcare safer globally for everyone. So now I'm gonna turn a little bit to some of the work that we've been doing and some of the research work that we've been undertaking locally. So from an acute deterioration point of view, so remember I started out this journey as the clinical lead for hospital at night, trying to understand how I was going to keep the patient safe at night. We'd already worked out very early that there was an afferent and an efferent limb of this response. 
So it's not just about the earlier detection of deteriorating patients. It's great if you can do that, but unless you can do something about that in terms of your treatment options and your human responses, that's never really going to make any difference for patients. And back when we were starting this, this is pretty much when the News 2 version of the National Early Warning School was coming in. So I think most people in this room will be familiar with the National Early Warning Score because it's really revolutionised how we've identified and monitored and supported patients. So there's no doubt that it standardised the way that we talk. I could go to any hospital in the United Kingdom and talk about a National Early Warning Score and give you a number and people would be able to understand what I mean by that. That clearly aids communication and we know that there is prognostic benefit and I'm going to come to some of that early data that links into that. But we have issues around that in the sense that we know that observations are intermittent and they still are user dependent. Some of the digital tools we have within our EHRs starts to make that better, but it doesn't take the problem away completely. So I already talked a little bit about the, some of the evidence behind the National Early Warning Score. And this is some, one of the early papers that was published. So if anyone can remember back to before 2008 when National Early Warning Scores were first implemented, you either had nothing or you had a local system or you had some combination of whatever had locally had been agreed. So this was one of the first studies that was done under the uh, sponsorship of the Royal College of Physicians. So the physicians were involved in this as well as the anaesthetists. And what, we were what they were looking at was how if you used National Early Warning Score, and this was News 1, not News 2, whether you could predict adverse outcomes for patients. And what they identified using a receiver operating curve approach was that actually the National Early Warning Score was predictive, particularly for things like dying within the next 24 hours or needing to be admitted to the intensive care unit. And part of the rationale and belief for that was that actually the addition of oxygen monitoring, saturations in particular, and I'm not going to talk too much about respiratory rate, although I'm happy to pick it up in the questions, the oxygen monitoring in particular may have added into that to give the extra utility over and above scores that were already present. Oh, I've gone back. So in terms of data, you might ask, well, why am I asking for lots of data? Because I've already got loads of it. So if we think about electronic health records, even just records that we would have kept on paper, we're already seeing lots of data come in from patients that we're trying to aggregate, and we as clinicians are already getting a lot of information about individual patients. So in particular, we focus a little bit on, on about patients and what's individual and personalised to them, and we're thinking about blood test results, and we're thinking about the data that we collect as part of a medical clerking. But what we don't get from this data is the wearable data. So I'm unusual today. I'm wearing an old-fashioned wristwatch, but my children wear smart watches, and I suspect most of the room now has a smart watch rather than a standard wristwatch. So we're already collecting, even if we don't know it, lots of physiological data, and we know that the consumer devices companies are providing more physiological data to individuals out in the community than we provide in hospitals. So I was very interested, together with the research team locally, in what data we could collect from wearables in the hospital setting, and particularly outside of the intensive care unit setting. So this is some early work that we did, just looking at what was out there in the literature to say, is continuous monitoring of general ward patients a good thing potentially to do or not? And what we did here was do a meta-analysis looking at the published studies to see whether there was any impact on outcomes that might matter to us. And what we were able to identify using that approach was that potentially there was a mortality benefit by using continuous data in general ward patients. We also saw some signals towards reduction in uh, critical care outreach, rapid response team activations, and reductions in essentially cardiac arrest, but those were non-significant because the numbers of studies that we were able to collate was actually quite small. We ended up with about 15 from a sample size of about 3,000. The data here wasn't as good as we wanted it to be. So that set us off on doing some research of our own. And one of the first things we did was start to look at if you had a wearable sensor on a patient, what kind of deterioration information were you picking up? So 
if you look at the literature and if you look at what I would say from my own experience, I'd say about 15% of patients deteriorate in a way that we recognise when they're on the general wards. But this is looking at data from a sensor where essentially we've got 500 patients wearing a sensor just looking at their physiological parameters and we're not sending out any alerts or alarms to the staff because all we wanted to know was what's actually happening. So you can see the amber and the red. Those were the sorts of things that we, were, we would identify, I suspect, clinically. But we started to pick up that in half of patients, there were already physiological events happening that perhaps we weren't recognising. And we haven't followed through completely because a little thing called COVID got in the way to look at what happened to the outcomes of these patients. But there's definitely a group of people who are who are, who are seeing and feeling physiological deterioration where we aren't necessarily as aware of that as perhaps the monitoring systems or they might be. So we're really looking at whether we can identify this group early and whether by doing that we can change the outcomes. So the other thing that we're thinking about is what does it mean for patients? So those 500 patients who wore the sensors, we asked them about what was their experience. Some of this was by questionnaire and some of this was by in-depth interview. And from a patient experience of sensors, there was lots of very positive feedback. So remembering that we didn't send any alerts and alarms through this, but actually patients were already taking this on to the next step. They're already saying that they feel more reassured when they're monitored and they were anticipating although we haven't evidenced this at this point, that they could see that there was a benefit from earlier detection. The other thing that came up very, very strongly from the patient interviews was actually concern about staff, and particularly about nursing staff. So anyone who works on any ward will tell you how busy and frantically rushed off their feet a lot of our nursing colleagues actually are. And, this, and our patients aren't oblivious to that. They very clearly identified that actually anything that could improve the workload, particularly of nursing staff, nobody talked about the doctors, particularly of the nursing staff, would make a big difference to their perception of the care that they were receiving. There's also a bit of the futuristic bit. They were very clear that they thought this was the healthcare of the future. And linking into what I said about the GE study, as part of this one, we essentially did something that was more in depth in terms of the interviews and questions that patients were asked. So I, I picked some quotes from here that I think cut through both studies, and it says that there's a clear concern about the wearability and how much of an intrusion devices are, and it's really important that the device is not intrusive. And I think the last quote sums it up for me from an experience point of view, that it isn't about technology only. Technology can't solve this. It's about the way staff, patients, and technology interact. So just to touch a little bit on the system that we were using just to explain it and I'm not a tech geek I've already confessed that but just in terms of understanding of what it does so the systems that we've used are basically bedside consoles so the ECG dots you can ignore because this is my research study patient I'm a cardiologist so we do ECGs all the time so if you ignore the ECG dots you can see pretty much what it looks like on a patient there's a central console with a a sort of mini pod that goes by the or a hub that goes by the patient's bedside and a bit like a smartphone you can either have the system sent sent the information to the hub or it can send it to the central monitoring or it can send it to both and we basically get to configure the level so that it works for that individual patient so the alerts the alarms we get to choose and we've done some work around that because when you have continuous monitoring systems as anyone who has a cardiac telemetry system will tell you, the alerts and the alarms when patients are active and ambulant aren't the same as when they are in bed and not doing very much. So just a quick summary of how much data we collected. So we ended up with 38,000 minutes worth of data with more than 2 million data points. And that's, I think, going to be one of the areas of focus, particularly as we move forward with electronic health records, is how we integrate that wearable data and that patient experience data to really drive change for patients. It was pretty much applicable to a wide range of ages and body types. So the oldest patient we've actually put a, on a monitoring system is now 101. At the time that we wrote this, that was 89, which still is not bad going. And in terms of weight, the largest patient we've managed to monitor successfully was 145 kilos. And I hope that's not going to be the average size of the patients we look after, but we know that people are getting larger. So I said I wasn't going to talk too much about respiratory rate, but I'm just going to pick this up very quickly here. 
So I haven't spoken very much about the types of sensors that are out there that people can use in terms of hospital bed bases. But one of the things I learned during COVID was that respiratory rate and oxygen are more important than I'd appreciated as a cardiologist previously. I always thought the lungs were the two bits of the organs that sat either side of the heart. Forgive me, I've obviously learned the error of my ways. But one of the things we know is that respiratory rate is actually really difficult to measure accurately. If anyone's ever seen an OBS chart and seen how often the respiratory rate is either 16 or 20, you'll sort of get what I mean by this. And one of my PhD students actually took some time to work out how long it took an HCA to do a set of OBS. It's about 13 minutes if you do them properly. So it's a lot longer, even with modern technology, than you think. So it's not surprising that respiratory rate, which is actually notoriously difficult to measure, is one of the worst things. And one of the things we've learned testing out numerous types of technology is that technology, that when it comes to measuring respiratory rate, is particularly vulnerable. And it's really important that we focus very much on making sure that the data that we are collecting is as accurate as it can be. And this is one of the examples from the GE study that I've mentioned, which uses two different points to measure the respiratory rate. And on the top band, you can see that we weren't picking up much of a signal. And on the bottom band, you can see the signal is much better. So the types of technology we are using matters as well as what the technology does. I've touched briefly on alarm protocols already, and I, we've done some work around trying to understand how we can change that to really maximize the benefit for patients. So I'm happy to pick that up in the questions. So I've said that this isn't just about patients and technology, it's also about the staff. And we know that particularly now, if you look at the next strikes we're planning for, how difficult it has been in terms of workload, where our elective care backlog is, that the pressures on staff are probably the greatest we've ever seen them. So as similar to the patients, we asked the staff their views of this technology and, this quest and the questions that we asked them are very similar. And if you look at the sorts of things that the staff were saying, there was a really clear focus on similar themes to what the patient said. So there was a lot about the future. There was a lot about what the current issues that people can see are and, then, and the concern about missing deterioration. There was particularly concerns about making sure that we could improve care for patients and that theme came through very strongly. And if we look at the portrait mobile system, Again, we did some particular questions and we asked about detail around what does it mean for you. You can see that the staff felt that it probably by essentially helped them to do, to do their monitoring work and the feedback was largely positive. And remember that at this point we're not sending out alerts and alarms, although we are now doing this and we have done this. So you might say, well, that's all well and good. You've just proven to me that technology can play a difference that actually staff don't mind it, or actually are positive, and patients really like it. But does this really matter in a cost and value-based healthcare system? And we can start to see some data now around this. So this comes from a study that's, again, US-based, because a lot of this work is happening globally. It's not just the NHS. Although the NHS, to be honest, is often really good at adopting technologies where they improve value for patients, paradoxically to a lot of the other things we do quite badly. And this is a study that's looking at the American healthcare model, and it's looking at opioid-related respiratory depression on surgical wards. That probably isn't such a scale of a problem in the United Kingdom as it is in the US because of the different types of pain relief and models and care models that we have. But using a remote monitoring system here, we can look to see evidence of res what they call RDEs, which is respiratory depression events, that actually that those patients who had opioid-related respiratory depression had a longer length of stay. And when you did the maths on this, that actually it was cost-effective to monitor and detect those earlier. But does that translate into an NHS setting? So there's really limited real-world evidence, and we've just started to look at that for us locally at Chelsea and Westminster. So we, across both sites of the trust, discharge about 24,000 patients from our general ward areas. That doesn't include intensive care, it doesn't include maternity, and it doesn't include paediatrics. So we've excluded those out. But across both sides of the trust, we have about 24,000 discharges. And of those people, we have about a 2% escalation rate to intensive care. So where a patient is admitted onto a general ward and then has to go up to an intensive care unit in an unplanned way. And when you start to crunch the numbers, Conservatively, we have about £4 million worth of cost that relates to those episodes of care. 
And most of the cost saving, if we could realise it, relates to transfer to the intensive care unit. Because going into the intensive care unit in an unplanned way is really bad for you on all sorts of levels. You can also start to see some savings that come from reduction in cardiac arrest calls and the critical care outreach team savings. So in a theoretical model using real-world evidence, actually it does begin to look like this, these technologies could save cost as well as improve care outcomes for patients. So I've talked a little bit about context. I, I thought I'd show you the Chow West context, and this isn't to say that this doesn't change, but at the time that that real-world evidence data was collected, Chelsea and Westminster had one of the best standardised hospital mortality indices in the country. Now, we all know how quickly things change, and we also all quickly know that we cannot compare these things directly. But if we, as with that kind of mortality level, demonstrate savings, the problem on the NHS is probably of a greater scale than I've shown today. So I'm just going to summarise very quickly, and hopefully then I've just left about 10 minutes or so for questions or, or discussion. We know that, unfortunately, from global data, that adverse events driven by hospital care and during hospital care are unfortunately common and remain so. And we know that this isn't going to be an easy problem for us to fix. There's got to be lots of partnership working and every part of the system has to focus on improving this for patients. We see increasingly emerging evidence that technology adds value and can help staff do their jobs. So talking about partnerships, I couldn't do all of this work without a huge crew of people behind me. So I've just put up my thank yous on the slide. Thanks so much for listening. Happy to take any questions or comments. I think we're almost there already, if I'm honest. So you're absolutely right. Part of the reason Apple and Samsung aren't in the healthcare market is because the regulatory hurdles are much, much greater. And to be honest, the concerns about data accuracy, data security, all of GDPR, all of those things that we would recognise make it much greater <coughs> hurdles and barriers to implementing technology like this in a hospital or a healthcare setting. But things like the virtual ward program that's rolled out across the country is essentially really blurring that, as well as the rollout of, of personal health records and patient portals. So we already see, for example, for something like Patients Know Best, you can integrate wearables and data into that. In fact, we've done that with some apps already. So I think those boundaries have probably already been crossed. The question is around managing it so we get maximum value for patients maximum value for staff and maximum value for the system. So uh, I've got another person called Sarja in the audience, and I didn't take her thunder by talking about engagement and human factors because that talks this afternoon. Mm -hmm. 
and she does it much better than I can. So our context where this study is done, and I didn't talk too much about West Middlesex where I do most of my day job, but actually we, we're based in Hounslow, we serve a very diverse population. Most of the members of the study that I mentioned, about a third of them are non-white, non-Caucasian. And one of the things that's really helped us is the simplicity of the technology, which makes it easier to explain. The other thing that helps us is the staff look like the patients. So there's representation. So our team of researchers is multi-ethnic, multi-diverse, which helps us in terms of recruiting patients. And we're very mindful about ensuring that the people who are recruited into the studies that we run are representative of the community that we serve. It's not easy, though. Just as well, I confessed up to being a cardiologist. <laughs> Question I have is, we've got all these models, and you probably have, have group set some alarm limits where the alerts went out. Now, deteriorating patient recognition remains a massive problem in the NHS. The data is there. The detection is there. My worry is people still don't take notice of what's happening. How are we going to overcome Somewhere along the line, the message gets lost. So if your saturation has dropped from a normal of 97 to 92, something is happening. Don't just tip the oxygen on and bring them up to 97. There is something happening which is causing it. And that's where I, 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 you know, I, I find that difficulty in getting that message across. I don't know how, how we do that, but it's, you know, we, we can have all the monitoring in the world we want. But if people don't recognize it, let's intervene, then you know, the monitoring is not, not going to be absolutely agree so I think Martha's story from the papers yesterday really highlights that and brings it to life so the technology of itself cannot solve these problems these problems are a human problem and particularly coming back to engagement what voice do patients have in their own care and their carers have in their own care mm -hmm. so unless all of these things come together will never make an impact on this problem but what I believe very strongly and as I've worked in this area and research more, got more data, that we cannot solve this as a human problem only because the challenges for our global healthcare workforce are just expanding exponentially. So we have to use other bits of the system and process to help us. The education piece is definitely there. And we know that some of this is that we have increasingly staff who are the wards are run by a foundation year doctor ones often. So the most junior staff in our systems often look after the most sickest patients outside of an intensive care unit setting. So it's not surprising that escalating, recognizing, decision making, prioritizing, all of those things will remain a challenge. And we can't solve that by saying, well, we'll just put more and more senior staff onto the ward areas because we don't have them for anywhere else either. So it really has to be about how do we use technology to support the humans to do what they need to do. I'm going to otherwise, if there's no other questions, I'm going to let you all go to lunch early. As I said, probably the most important part of the day. Thanks so much for listening.